Right, good evening all. Sorry for the technical problems. We have a problem our speaker had really low bandwidth where she where she's staying at the moment. So uh, we have we're trying to uh, upload the slides somewhere where I can present them better. Anyway, thank you all for joining. Um, we'll give it one more minute and then we'll start. Oh, the slides are nearly there. Good. In fact, uh, just check whether people are still out there. Anybody on on Zoom can give me a thumbs up or a wave. It's the button towards the right on your bottom line. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Oh my Right, I think we better make a start. So good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, April's BCS meeting. We normally, uh, the week before, but of course it was still the Easter holiday. So uh, this one's been moved from its usual mo usual monthly slot to a bit later in the month. Um, and also Tiago normally hosts these, uh, busy with work, something else with work related today. So he's asked me to host. So I'm also on the local BCS committee. Tiago's a, the chair and I'm one of the other committee members, but I've been on the committee for as long as Tiago has, I think. Um, right, so I want to introduce you to our speaker today, uh, Dr. Joanna Lang, or Jo Lang as I call her. Um, she is a senior researcher at the University of Leeds. And her background is that her degree was, I think at Leeds, but then she went on to Manchester to do a master's and PhD. And that's where I, I also worked in the same group as Joe Lang at the University of Manchester. That was about 20 something years ago, Joe. Um, um, yeah, that's right. And so in, in those days at Manchester, Manchester hosted the National HPC service. It's now hosted in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre. But in those days it was in Manchester. And I was on that team and it was a larger group that did both high performance computing and visualization. And Joe Lang's speciality was doing the visualization. I was working on the computer codes, uh, porting them and getting them to run on a crazy supercomputer. And Joe was, uh, her projects were do with visualization, particularly, um, I remember particularly projects to do with circulation of the mantle. So 3D visualizations of circulation of all that stuff below the ground surface, going down to the center of the earth. Yeah. That's right. I've even got a bit on this in the talk then. Oh, good. The, the yellow, um, side, your, yellow walls. Yeah, uh, it's it's um a talk going through my career and how the technologies I've used have changed as we've gone, and then I can so, yes. so it's a it bit was, of a. In those days, it was AVS, Advanced Visualization System. But looking back on it, it's not particularly advanced by modern standards, but was at the time. <laughs> That's right. Well, I've sent you the link now. Can you see that for the slides? For email. Uh, email. Thank you. I'll get that. I'll get in there. So as, as a graphics person, my slides have got lots and lots of pictures in, which is what, why we've had so many problems tonight. Well, one of the reasons because I've got a very big uh, presentation with lots of videos and pictures in them, which I think are quite nice. So the the talk today is on um, how computers have changed science. So I I think of myself as a scientist, but scientists think of me as a software engineer. And uh, I've written software to solve lots of different scientific problems over time using different um, computing technologies, and there's some trends <coughs> that I'm going to pick up at the end of this that I think are, are changing and how things are going to go. So we're looking back through time. So um, Dan and myself will yes. sort of recognise. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, 
some of the things. Sorry for the cough. I'm just waiting have, for the have, link to come through, by the way. Are Isn't you downloading or have you not got the link? I haven't got an email link yet. Oh, right. So and that's the worry. Well so let's go back and see if we can solve that. So, um, of course, technology never does what you want it when um, <coughs> when you're doing this sort of thing. So, I'm going to try and put it in the chat channel, Dan. Yeah, so you can put it into the make do the chat just to me if you know how to do that. Okay, it's saying just to you now. Yeah. So I think that should just have come through now can you yeah, see that hopefully you've got a better internet than me is that looking like it's downloading it is coming up in sharepoint oh okay i think we're struggling it says joe it says we're sorry but my name Cannot be found in the SharePoint directory. Oh, right. Okay. So let's go back to the SharePoint so you directory. Yeah. You haven't given the right permissions. <coughs> and. But. <laughs> yes, because he wants me to sign in. Yeah. Uh, username at leads. Yeah. It's. There's a link to this anyone. Let's go with the anyone option. <clears throat> now let's see if that works any better. There we go. Is that one? Is that link working any better for you? Fingers crossed. Moment. Ooh. That sounded good. Yes, I've got it. Yay. Brilliant. Right. So. <clears throat> oh, well. It, that happens. I, I, yeah, I'm just loading it now. It's. It's only 7.1 megabytes. Oh, is it? Oh, no, that's just the first slide then. I must have done something <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I did. Uh, mm. Anyway, I'll drop uh, off video myself because I'm not centre of attention. Did that, have you got the whole talk then, or just that one? No, that no. first slide. Uh, it runs to 19 slides. Um, there should be 36 slides. Oh, and the, it's been corrupted somehow. We've lost well, data the 19th, on it. The 19th slide says thank you. Oh, does it now? Hmm. Do you want to put the slides up so I can see them and we can at least give that talk, no matter what that one is? Right. <clears throat> okay. um, slide show from the beginning in there and share. And share that one. There you go. Right, okay. So this is a broken set. This isn't the proper set that I was meant to give, but let's let's do this better slide. Oh <laughs> no, <laughs> this is the wrong set of slides because this is the October. This is the steering group for my <laughs> this isn't going very well, is it? <laughs> Let's talk, Joe. Okay, Joe, I think 
might have to just go with you presenting it and we'll just apologize for any slow slide changes. I mean, hopefully by yeah. having audio on mobile, you've got as a sideband, then we've got uh, a bit more bandwidth for the pictures. So Wait wanna... a sec. I'm just going to give one more go of getting the link. There we go. So, <clears throat> so this is just a look through my career in a way to see the different things I've done. So I started off a long, long time ago doing a degree in biophysics, which had a strong element of imaging in it. Well, imaging now is all digital and the detectors and everything are digital. So that's where I've moved in terms of my computing. Um, then I worked for a while in medical testing and I did a master's conversion into computer science in 1996. And to give an idea of what the technology was like at that time, um, I had a hardbound thesis with only two colour images in it, which is completely unheard of to now. You'd have a massive... Um, PDF file and your screen is colour so you can have animations and all sorts going on in there and hyperlinks that work. So in 1996 um, to 1997 I worked on a local academic visualisation service so that was 3D visualisation it was looking at data from simulations of weather forecasts, the earth. It was medical at the start so at that time we had STIO2s, which were sort of state-of-the-art. We were really excited because we had the support for texturing and we had one gig of memory, which was amazing. We had a large cathode ray tube display unit. And for our programming environment, we used the Emacs text editor with um, C++ because it's graphics. And the <clears throat> silicon graphics had IRIX, which was his own proprietary uh, OS soft operating system. So we released the software to an open source repository. And all the documentation we had was chatting to people in the office or looking through books, which were in hard copy. So in 1998, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Manchester Baby. We're at the University of Manchester at the time. The machine room opposite us, computers had got considerably smaller, so there was a fair amount of space in there for local local enthusiasts to build the first, rebuild the first computer. It's currently in the Museum of Science and Engineering, I think, in Manchester. I might slightly have got that name wrong. So Museum the, um, Industry. Yeah, that's the one. We used to go up there, didn't we, with conferences and things to show them. Um, and it was the first stored memory computer. It used a cathode ray tube, actually, to store information. It could store 1,024 bits, nothing more than that. And a word was 32 bits long. So the a program was on punch card, or they used to write it out on paper to check it beforehand. So I've got some images of that, which you're you're missing out on, I'm afraid. So that was 80 years ago now. That was um, quite a while ago. So as part of the celebrations of that, I was given um, a CT scan of an Egyptian mummy, which was, um, it was used for research at the local museum, the Manchester Museum, where the exhibition for the Manchester baby was going to be. So it was, there were problems with it, but I managed to create some nice uh, animations of the, the outside of the cartouche of the mummy and the, the skull, which was uh, exhibited at the Manchester Museum several times and the Science Museum and was uh, shown in lots of places, the uh, conferences that the group went to. Um, Computer Graphics World. Um, had it in an article called Unraveling the Mysteries of the Mummy, which was published in 2000. 
And it said it was one of the most important images of the last 25 years. So that was quite exciting for me. And this was the start of the digitisation of many museums, artefacts and books, which, which was really the start of the data deluge, if you've heard of that, big data, which eventually ran to the start of the Turing Institute, which was in the British Museum. So they digitised all the books there and that sort of fed into, into that. <clears throat> So in 1999, that's when I first met Dan, and uh, we started a national academic high-performance computing service, um, and that ran to 2007, although I think Dan left a little bit before that. We yeah, so I left in, crazy... in which one was it? 2008 when I left. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, but we didn't get refunded at the end of it, so you made a good, sensible choice to leave at that point. So at the time we got that, it was the fourth most powerful computer in the world. Um, and then we got a Silicon Graphics Origin 2000 system. Um, <clears throat> we, we were, importantly, we had a, we had a news data that we sent out to the news, to the users. It was printed and went in an envelope. So once every quarter, we have to go into the office and fill the envelopes with the, the letters rather than just putting it in a an email um, that was sent round. That service was considered different to all the others that came forward because we gave the users the opportunity to say how much they liked it. So it was the start of rankings for this sort of service. And then in the background, Cray was bought out by SGI. NVIDIA recruited all the SGI hardware specialists. And that's where the, the GPUs and NVIDIA's hardware has come from. And Cray separated from SGI. And during all of this, one of the most important things that I think happened is we stopped having uh, proprietary operating systems on these big systems so now we have open source operating systems which seems to work quite well they seem to be quite resistant to cyber attacks and other other things that go on we also had a we had a virtual environment a big room with a curved screen and multi it had three projectors projecting onto it so we had to merge the output from three different projectors and we could see this in stereo. It was a great collaborative environment and very good for communicating science to um, to the public. I've got some lovely pictures here of things that we did on that, including the application that Dan said, but unfortunately you're not oh, able I'm, to see I'm it. I'm getting there. You're getting no, there, yeah. Getting there. It's, it's a big file, isn't it? It's a big file, and also you have to append ampersand download equals one to the URL, otherwise it won't download it. Oh, I've you see, that's, new. that's, that's, and I don't even know how you found that out, so <laughs> that's what happens when you, you um, <clears throat> do these things, I would never have guessed you had to put an ampersand one at the end, I don't even know, anyway, so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly there. So we had a manager at the t yeah, fingers crossed. We can go back and I can show you all the pictures or Dan can show you the pictures um, once we got there. So not only did we have a virtual environment in, in the room, but we also had the ability to do video streaming from the HPC systems that we had. So we had a, a manager, Nigel John, who'd come from SDI, who was very keen on this at the time. And he ran a project called Op3D, which used visualization created on a supercomputer and it pumped it down the road to Man Manchester Royal Infirmary and the operating theater in there. Um, and we had to have a especially simple UI or for the surgeon because the surgeon had uh, was in the middle of operating. So he had rubber gloves on and his hands had sort of blood and other things all over them. So we had to use a we used a joystick which we covered in a plastic bag and sterilised so that he could use it so he could move around the environment <clears throat> and we also were we were part funded by SGI so we're doing some um, research into graphical user well 
how you navigate around 3D spaces at that time. Um, and this was part of the e-science funding, which um, also sort of led into cloud. Unfortunately, we stopped funding it in the UK before we got the financial benefits of it. And this sort of business idea of um, 3D graphics is, is what Meta looked at for a while, but it is very difficult. I don't, it's quite nice. It's very difficult to do well. I don't think we found the killer app for that quite yet. So I also did a lot of visualization for finite element analysis, which is what Dan was known for in the day that I knew him. And um, I did lots of applications in there. And I also completed a part-time PhD, which was at Manchester. It, it took about eight or nine years to do. A, the title was a visualization toolkit for solar physicists. So two years into the part-time study, the visualization community decided that they didn't like the research methodology I was using and they kind of removed it. So I ended up looking at, with a sociologist, looking at research methods and how the adoption of the computational method was spreading across um, academia. So that's that's where my work went. And we still are adopting it. It's not fully taken on board yet. So once we, after that, I had a short career break and I got a job at the University of Leeds where I started working in biomechanical engineering. So this was 2013. And at this time I was developing a, a simulation of um, artificial hip joints. Um, we were trying to test artificial. Artificial hips have to be tested to destruction in the lab. And we wanted to develop a model so that we could uh, reduce the testing time inside the lab. So it was for developing a new ISO standard for, um, for the testing of uh, new designs of artificial hip. Um, ah, here we go. And here we've got the talk. I don't know how we want to go through this, Dan. How do you... Well, let me, let me just tell me next slide until we get to the point where you want to um, go through slowly. All right. So, this, um, yeah, there's my thesis with the, t the two colour pictures in it. And this is the environment we've got, which uh, uh, cathode ray tubes. Some people might not have even seen them now. We didn't have IDEs in the middle. We have a text editor. And then we've got the command line on the right. Um, so if you go to the next one. Dan? Ah, oh, yeah. And this is the computer. So this is a computer 80 years ago with a program. This was the, the mummy that I visualized, which was quite difficult to do for reasons that are too long to in here but it was shown at lots of museums as an aside by the way i did a little bit of work with the same professor and she actually used the ct scan of her own head and had an early 3d printer and she 3d printed her own skull so when i went to see oh, her wow. she had her own skull on her own desk brilliant when that did you work that, with her uh, late 90s i think before i joined oh. The, the group you were in. When I was trying to find a research direction of my own, she had a, oh, a, a okay. 1990s quality 3D printer. Ah, uh, well, it, yeah, they used to, she was very good actually. There's not many Egyptologists around. They only, I think there's a degree course which only has six people a year on it or something crazy. So there's very few of them. She was very good. Anyway, right, we digress. So Caesar service. Yeah, so the, ne the next one. So we look, there's the magazine, the newsletter that yep. we used to um, send out. There we go to some yellow circles, which I gave a hint at at the beginning. There we go. And here are the, um, well, the visualizations of the whole, the whole Earth, um, seismic tomography of the whole Earth. Uh, we've got some other things on the left. You can see the virtual environment 
And we also have the, we used to have a graphical, um, a visual language for AVS, which was a visualization system, which you can see at the top. We've got a tornado as well. And then right at the bottom in the blue, that's um, a liquid crystal, a visualization of a liquid crystal. So there they were a variety of and that, that, that was the, the curved wall. We had a whole room taken over with a big 3D curved, 3D uh, wall that you could project onto. And so that was an early Absolutely. VR. And that's that's the main building of the University of Manchester, isn't it? All the graduates yes. used to go through there. Um you could get about 30, 40 people in in that room. They've just got five. So here we have the, he was a liver surgeon who did operations on people with liver cancer. So this won the special award for Nigel John and went on to, um, oh, it was a science programme on the BBC that it was part of as well. Tomorrow's World, was it? Horizon, I think, but I'm not sure. Something oh, like. okay. So, yeah, so we were interested in how you navigate around because in the virtual world you don't want to walk all the way around an object and how you, how they move can be quite quite difficult to understand so we were trying to accelerate and decelerate the object the the object as we moved i don't know why in the operating theater he's got a face there that doesn't make sense because he was a liver surgeon there was a project using haptics as well with the idea of doing virtual surgery by having a surgeon in one location holding a pen that actually controlled a scalpel in another location. Yeah, I mean, I think some of those techniques are, have been used a bit more. It seems to be going down robotics sort of avenue now with the medical. Yeah, you do robot do surgery rather than have a, a human control it remotely. Yeah, um, but I think there's still plenty of surgeons, to be honest. I think, um, anyway, so here we got the finite elements, and I think that data set of the CERN tunnel in the middle came from you, Dan, didn't it? Yeah, it's mine. In fact, the one at the bottom, the, the blue and red one's on mine as well. That's a, um, yeah. a, a an Arctic platform for drilling. The red bit's a big floating steel shell. Yeah. And the top right is an excavation. It's digging out a hole, looking how the ground moves. It's a digging out a large chamber. Absolutely. Uh, um, and then on the left, we've got a crack propagation, haven't we? Yes. Anyway, do you want to? Um, are we back up to live yet, or do you want to? We're nearly. This is my PhD. We can go through that very fast. Um, ended up working, looking at how things were adopted, which is a sociological or a society community based um, thing. Uh, usability isn't um, isn't won't directly affect how things are adopted. It'll think people are more likely to use something that's easy to use, but it doesn't just because it's something's easy to use doesn't mean it's adopted and the visualization community at that time were convinced that ease of use would would mean that it would be adopted which didn't happen so uh, that ended up being what I looked at with a sociologist for quite a long time if you go to the next one Dan yeah <clears throat> have I missed one no, uh, no. Is... yeah yeah, yeah. So the next one is where we were, where we were at, where I moved to uh, biomechanical engineering, and this sort of simulation we were trying to replace uh, laboratory um, experiments. You know, um, you have to test certain certain things that you create in engineering to destruction. So a car, you might test an aeroplane you test to destruction and artificial hips you test to destruction so this is shows you the machine that you test an artificial hip in they actually turn the hip upside down for the testing so the the structure that's going up on the right hand side should be the other way around and that should go down your 
your femur and then the ball is actually part of your your hip and then the pull cycle is your walking cycle if you move to the next screen Dan yeah and then you play the video in the next screen yeah so we can see what we've got here is some uh, feet something called edge loading which happens when the, the socket and the ball aren't in alignment. So you can see as, as, um, as you're putting pressure on the, on the hip and you're putting your foot on the ground, we've got a slightly pink area at the top, which is the pressure that's going on to the, to the socket. And then this is between, as your foot rolls from the heel to the, to the ball, and as it goes up, the pressure on the socket is released and the two become separated. So you get this system because they're not centred properly. You get this sort of micro gap forming. The problem is when it, you can see it just forming now on the left is a little gap forming between the socket and the joint. And we've taken, this is when the, legs swinging in the air before the heel's going to come down and when the heel comes down the edge on the top surface hits into the ball and we get something called edge loading so that was the first thing I did after my career break when we finished and so we're now coming on the left hand side we we're coming towards the end of the swing of the leg and we're coming to the point where the heel's going to hit down on the ground and there'll be a large force put on the socket quite rapidly. So, and here we go. You can see on the top, the uh, we can see the arrow coming out showing the force that is on the edge. And that's um, very fast. It's being pushed back into its place. But we get something called edge loading, which causes a lot of wear and the wear chips off bits which can affect your immune system. So try and avoid having any surgery, in my opinion, until you really need it. If we go to the next slide, please, Dan. Yeah. So after that, oh, so yes, this is where image-based modelling has arrived as a research method in biomechanical engineering using simple wear. And this is relevant to my fellowship because the fellowship I'm currently working on is developing software for novel forms of imaging. And that includes being able to simulate with the, from the image data later on. So if we move on to the next slide, So after this, I relocated into the local HPC service. I wanted to work part time for lots of reasons. But by this time, it was about seven, eight years since I left Manchester. And HPC hardware had really modularized. Um, the Internet had become much more important. And with the modularization, that meant that you could swap out disks and, and um, chips and things whilst the computer was running and this was a, a massive advantage and it, it's a it's an indicator that the the computing technology is much more stable and we're getting to grips with it it's an as a, it's an adoption thing so stability is is in terms of adoption as a technology becomes more stable it gets taken up so at this time, the Software Sustainability Institute was uh, sort of starting to campaign for research software engineers. That previously they hadn't. It was difficult to have a career in that area, which is probably one reason why Dan chose to leave. But they've focused on RSEs and centralised teams, which wasn't particularly what I wanted to do in my fellowship. And then, of course, open data and open repositories and open science have become much more popular. So we also have uh, websites like Zenodo, which I think was set up by Stern for the sharing of data. So if we move to the next one. 
So this was laying the ground for my fellowship and, and what I was trying to do. So this is the strategy for all part one of the strategy for my fellowship. So this is the Abernathy and Utterback curve, which is part of the innovation pipeline. You can have multiple of ones of these. So as a, at the start of an innovation, you have a fluid phase where you need lots of flexibility. And this can be for a, any sort of product, a soft piece of software, a IT services, uh, offering whatever then you go into the middle of the transitional phase where things are starting to get into place and then you have the specific phase at the end where it's stable and you you can just um you you need to keep the service steadle, steady you know what what's what you can keep everything in place so you um if you press the button now Uh, what we should doing? get a little. We should have an animation in the. Oh, on the. the okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Hey, there we go. So, our SEs in centralised teams, oh, are working outside of the research group, so they tend to be working on more stable software, where the terminology and the research is much better understood, but. With the work that I did, because I mainly worked with new users to HPC, I was much closer to the beginning of the innovation pipeline. So that's what I I aimed for. So I was, well, I've come back from a career break as well. So I wasn't able to bring any software that I've been working on for a number of years. So that was my strategy to work on software that was close to the point of innovation. And by this time, you saw before the, the slide where we had the um, silicon graphics machine. Now I have what looks like a desktop machine that everybody has. Um, it has two GPUs in it, or the one at work has two GPUs, but because of lockdown, I don't have that. I bought a workstation with just one GPU in it. In the middle, I use a variety of IDEs, depending on what the users that I work with once I use Spider, Visual Code, Notepad++ for legacy code. And I also, I use a Windows machine now. I haven't got a Linux system, but I use Windows subsystem for Linux when I'm developing software that's legacy. And that legacy software will be C++. C++. But generally, I'm now writing in Python um, with some bits. There's a bit of Cython with legacy stuff or with code where there's seed that needs to be part of it. We also use the uh, version control linting and profiling tools. What I would really like to start using, these are profiling is one of the key things that we do in academia, but the structure of the code is, is terrible with the older stuff. So some of the tools that are suitable for identifying bad structure, I'd like to start using. Um, we release the software on Bitbucket or GitHub, but we can also package it up in a zip file and put it on Zenodo, which we do when we publish. And there are journals like JOS, which is a journal for open source software, which I've published too, um, which is a big change because we weren't able to do that. Hurrah, documentation is online. We can do a digital search on it and we can find all sorts of things. We can also look on Stack Overflow, Google search, and on YouTube when we've got a difficult user interface to look at, um, which is lovely. It's much easier to work by yourself when you've got that sort of thing. Although you should be working as a team. And our meetings are on Teams or Zoom, which is also a good profile, I find, for sharing software and looking at problems in it. So if we can move to the next slide. The, te the technology underneath, where I'm programming has changed quite considerably and how we work, we can all work from home, which is, is quite good. So it seems to be So I'll go to this one. Yeah. Second strategy for my fellowship was because I was starting fresh. I didn't I'd had a career break. I wanted to write software near the beginning of the innovation pipeline, but I wanted to have multiple people to work with, multiple stars or, um, yeah, multiple 
well-established researchers to work with. So it spreads the risk a bit more and it allows you to meet more people and might software that's more likely to be used. So one of these people was uh, Sven Schroeder from the School of Chemical and Process Engineering. He uses Diamond Light Source, which is a the national synchrotron in um, Oxfordshire. And he needs, well, he, he finds that he gets a lot of support when he's at Diamond, but it's very, very difficult to analyse his data when he comes back to the campus. It's just not the support there. And his work is in crystallisation and he's interested in sort of the new physics, well, trying to really understand the physics and chemistry that happens at that time, which isn't properly understood. If you could go to the next slide, please, Dan. Yeah. So this is an area of um, material science, crystals. And this is one project I worked on with him. Um, so I met a PhD student of his called uh, Gunjan. And um, she had loads of videos, thousands of frames, but she spent months and she could just vaguely see the outline of a crystal. I'm not sure if you can see the crystal there. Dan's going to press a button and there's going to be an animation with an arrow saying where the crystal is. It's very, very faint. It's very difficult to spot that. So we found a way of uh, magnifying this difference using um, Euler's magnifier. There was a different technique that we might have been able to use. But um, you can see here that we can much more clearly make out the crystal when we use the Euler's magnifier. Um, so at this point, lockdown happened and we weren't able to collect any more data from Diamond Light Source. So if you move to the next screen, please, Dan. So by this time, Jonathan Pickering was working with me. So we decided to develop some software that would allow the user to annotate. It took Gunjan about two years to annotate her data. So we've developed this software that is developed in Python and PyQt5, which allows you to mark up the edge of the crystals and do various other, other things with it. I've not included an animation of this here. Um, so the crystals or cris crystals of molecular crystals have different growth rates for different faces of the crystal. So we've we've developed a system that will map each face of the crystal, and then we can see how each face grows differently, and then we can work out where the crystal well what orientation the molecules have within that crystal, which we really want to be able to detect needles, sharp crystals, because they block up uh, machinery that is used to make crystals for the packing in medical tablets and such like. So if you move to the next screen, Dan. There we go. So this, yeah, you're gonna, you, we've got, a, some animation on this slide. So this time, initially when I started, we just released software to the uh, AVS um, repository and we passed it to someone in the office and they they could um, put it into the repository. But now we use um, GitHub. If we press again, and then we can also publish it as a paper in JOS, which is the journal for open source software. And if you press again, we can put it on Zenodo where we a lot of data is made freely accessible. It's free to use. And finally, if you press again, we've also put anim uh, videos of how to use it with the subtitles in so that users can follow it because it's got quite a complex user interface and multiple tabs. So that's a lot more sophisticated than when I started writing software. So if you could move to the next one, please, Dan. So 
Oh, right. So I've missed out. There were there was another slide there that we seem to have lost. Oh, sorry. Which shows I'm also, uh, no, no, it, it's just not there. I, I might have missed it okay. out. So I've also down worked down. with... Yeah, go on. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's got lost. So also I worked for my fellowship. I was working with Sven Schroeder, Michelle Peckham, who's a light my light microscopist and does cell biology and also uh, Rick Drummond and he he's a material scientist so I I I've I set out to work with three scientists but through that work I also met up with another couple of scientists to work with and this is one of the things I think if you become a freelancer which being an academic or my branch of what I do in academia is a bit like being a a freelancer and you need to know people and network. So it's a good strategy to have to work with more people and spread out in that sort of way. So I've been working with Sarah Harris on the FFEA work, which we're going to look at a bit more. And I also did some work with the LGI on uh, spines um, and spine surgery. Just so for the sake the of the next... people on the call, what do those abbreviations mean? Which ones? Any of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the next slide is going to tell you what FFEA stands for. Right, okay. Here we so go. I'm hoping there's no other ones that are real. Yeah, there we go. So we saw some slides earlier on of finite element analysis, which is Dan did um, when I knew him at Manchester. Yeah. And this is a fluctuating finite element analysis, which, which the physicists call simulates the MISO scale. So it's a very, very, um, it's not atomic, it's between atomic and large biological molecules. So it's putting a surface on a large biological molecule and then it's adding the thermal fluctuations that you'd expect at that area. So that's why it's called fluctuating, because we've added the thermal fluctuating. So it's using the finite element analysis sort of methodology, but we've added thermal fluctuations, which is the noise that you get uh, in Brownian motion or other areas. So... I don't know this equation very well because I didn't do it, but Dan would probably explain it to you. But there's could, the new. I can explain it to you, but I won't. I'll spare you with it. Ah, uh, well, you know, welcome to. Um, but they've added a, a, an extra term for thermal noise at this level, and that makes the, the, the mesh wobbles around. You can see it wobbling around like a protein on the left, like a jelly on the left. And on the right, you can see um, two spheres that there's no friction or, or I can't remember what else there is. It, it's not physically accurate, but it's just showing you what happens when, when two blob-like molecules would bump into each other. They sort of bound off each other. So that's, and the, so, at an atomic level, we understand what happens there. That's quantum physics. And then at a, a ground scale, at the mechanical scale, we understand a bridge. But what we're, at, what we're simulating here is at the point where we don't really understand what the physics is doing, where the physics transitions from quantum to mechanical physics. So there are physical issues in this area which make it quite exciting to study. So we're really simulating large biological complex, large biological molecules that form complexes and how they work together. And the molecular motor, which is in charge of moving these little molecular motors, they have little feet on them and they walk around cells carrying substrates around. The simulations are quite peculiar to see. I don't have any with me because I'm, we've not got that far. But if you can move to the next slide, then please, then. Uh, 
there we go. So this is the workflow for for flexible fluctuating finite element analysis. We either take in a molecular structure, which is an EMBD or BD PDB file. So that's a molecular structure, and then we can put a surface on that. Or we take an image of it from cryo EM and we put an isosurface around the edge. Once we've got the triangular surface, we can use many tools like PetGen to create a mesh that goes into the, into the molecule. And then once we've done that, we can assign material properties. Again, what is a material property of a large molecule? We're not quite sure what that is, and we're sort of trying to understand that. And we also have protein-protein interactions. So molecules will attract and repel each other in different ways. And we need to add that to it. Once we've assigned all of this, as you can imagine, up to that point, it's quite graphical. You need quite a lot of visualization tools to help you understand that. And then you run the FFEA simulation. That writes out um, results for each time slip. And once you put the time steps together, you get an animation or what they call a trajectory. And then you can see these animations on the left, which is the trajectory. So this is the, here we've got the DNA of COVID in the middle, and they're trying to understand the molecular motor that replicates the, pro, the DNA in, in um, COVID. Um, and they entered this into a into a prize. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Dan. Yeah. Again, this looks blank. Should I go to the next one? Yeah. All right. I mean, that's that's, that's not... twenty six. So oh, got okay. So here plus. we've got. I can't see anything on that one. Yeah, it says repaired, so it, it it's uh, okay. it's not worked. Let's go to the next slide because I think yep. this one is is fine. Oh, I so what we had was we had four large molecules, and um, we had them all separated. And as the FFEA simulation ran, it um we could see them all sticking together and how they would stick together in a in a in a petri dish it wasn't realistic for in a in a virus so this is a tool that we've developed using python pyqt5 and opengl which allows us to explore the slither elements so the very small or very long and thin elements in the mesh cause the simulation to um, to break. So we've developed this tool which will allow us to explore and look at the meshing that's happening. So this is a mesh of the there's an error checking protein in um, DNA replication. This is the error checking protein, and this is the pet gem mesh that was produced and we can see there are tiny little elements in there and you can see there's no wonder the edges um if one of those corners of the tetrahedron is vibrating with thermal noise it's likely to go across the other side of it and then you've got an inversion as we call it but this is all written in um python pyqt5 and opengl and we wrote this with the whilst working with the scientists to find out what they needed. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Dan. And so now we're trying to use simulated annealing, which is currently what we were working on, to optimize the size and shape of the tetrahedral element. So it iterates through all the through a series of solutions progressively to provide a better solution. This is a generic definition of what simulated annealing is. So we're not talking about the mesh in this particular case. And occasionally it will take a worse simulation. Uh-oh. Um, 
Yeah. So there you can see the, we also have a cost function. And generally you want the cost function to go down, but you might end up in a, in a local um, energy minima and you need to occasionally jump out of that. So unfortunately, we haven't got the. Sim if you yeah, go to the next, next slide, slide isn't showing for me. This should have been a picture of the mesh with the nodes just moving around randomly, not in a in a in a way that is changed by the cost function as it goes. So if you go to the next slide, this is showing the cost function reducing as it as it goes down. Um, we haven't finished this algorithm quite yet. If you go to the next slide, I've got a feeling there's... Mm, and there we've yeah. got um, different ways we can render and look at the... use to look at the molecule. And here we have... Um, we're also developing a different marching tetrahedra algorithm to mean that we have similar size and shape tetrahedra in the centre of the mesh. So unfortunately, we've missed some slides out there. Sorry about that. Um, but having this sort of tetrahedra in the mesh rather than ones defined by tetgen is likely to make FFEA much more stable and making it more stable means that we can run longer time steps, we can run bigger simulations for longer and discover more about the physics and how molecular motors work so i think that's the end ah oh, here we go no here's here's the different renderings so on the left we have the pi mole rendering which is is normal and then we've used a watercolor effect in the middle which kind of draws out where the tetrahedra are a bit better and then we have a sketch effect on the right as well so i don't know which one you prefer I know which one I was going to ask, but I can't see him. Um, if you can move to the next one, please, Dan. Yeah. So that's that's really what I've been up to for the last 20 odd years of my life, which is quite a while. And um, there's lots of things that have happened. Um, so these are some views, I think, of how how the trends that I've sort of tried to point out in the talk are, are moving. So I think automation of uh, software development is happening, partly through AI, that's being talked about a lot in the news at the moment, but also through uh, just everyone, if you've got it on a Git service, Microsoft has brought out GitHub now. I think they they run a, run software on it just to see what the you know what, how good it is for cybersecurity. I think they suggest changes to poorly written um, oh poorly written software that runs on the web so that people can stop using particular functions that are known to be problematic. So I think there'll be much more automation. Um, so if that automation happens, you still got to identify what you need the software to do. And the people skills of software development become much more important as the automation comes in place. We're still having a data deluge. It's still big data. New computing technologies, especially AI, continue to open up new areas of research. Um, really, the user interface in science in particular has been ignored, and there's a lack of visualization currently. Um, hopefully more automation and AI will be used to do that and personalize it. A lot of the people I know in HCI say that will happen, but it's not happened quite yet. And we'll have a continued modularization of software and hardware environment, which allows containerization and virtualization to be done. It allows us to have hybrid hardware and software solutions all running at the same time. And in this way, we can just keep on using the legacy software that we've already got. I don't think we're ever going to rewrite it. So 
the biological simulate example, some people compare software to the way molecules are in the body or cell and that they just, uh, if they've got a function, they just keep on being used um, and don't evolve. So it looks that way to me. And then um, as the cloud becomes, you know, as computers become more stable, it's going to become more and more cost effective to use cloud solutions. So the pay as you use model will become more popular. I've not heard uh, any comments from Dan on that one. So I'm assuming you're in agreement with these ones so far. I've got a second oh, slide. It's not for me to comment. I'll let other people comment about that. I, I um, have some of my own. Okay. And also my views on the cloud, for example, the cloud maybe pay as you go, but you pay more per minute than you would by earning it yourself. Maybe, maybe, but that could change with time. Yeah. There's also another problem with networking as well, isn't there? So if you can go to the... Yes. Yeah. I've got a second slide of, of future things. Oh, here we go. So remote working, learning and technical sharing becomes more popular because you've got the network there. But... Um, so both cloud and remote working have become more sustainable, so it's easier to work from home. That saves on energy a bit. Um, but you've got to have emergency recovery for poor network dropout. Network dropout has been a bit of a problem tonight, hasn't it? So um, better emergency recover for that would be lovely, um, both in terms of carrying on a simulation running, but for all sorts of systems, what do you do when the network's not working for you? That needs to be improved. Um, a general purpose HPC is being replaced by HPC for very specific problem types. Currently, this is more your area, Dan, actually, that one. And um, we've got quantum computing coming on, which I'm very excited by as well. Um, it's the second paradigm of computing that we've had, or maybe the third, I don't know, in, if you count the abacus as the first one, which was wood, wasn't it? But it's like you should look at all the different, or I try to look at the different types of computing paradigms as, as how I would build a house. So we started off with what would be a straw house or a wood house, and quantum is going to be like a brick house and then each a brick house is better in some environments than a wood house and a wood house is better in some environments than a brick house and I think the same will be true for quantum but quantum will have a real problem for our current encryption and cyber security so that's those are my views on how things are going to change in the future and then I, I have a thank you slide at the end and um I wonder what will happen, what will change with computing and technologies for the rest of your career. So, so that's it. Any questions? Well, thank you very much, Joe. That was a very interesting talk. I apologise to everybody for the technical problems we had uh, at the beginning, but um, we got there in the end. And thank you for all the people on the call that persevered um, in spite of us starting quite late and having to... Me, me show the slides and therefore some of the pictures didn't come out properly anyway um i'll stop showing the screen there uh if anybody wants to ask a question please do so in the chat you're also most welcome to take yourself off mute and ask a question directly and to get the ball rolling i'll go first um so joe what's you, over the last 20 years languages come and languages go um for somebody starting off now would you get them should, would you say they should use fortran or use pascal or use what <laughs> yeah so um oh so the most used language apparently is java so it does depend on which application area you want to work in to be honest in in academia, most people are now using Python. 
so Python is, the, I don't think it's the best possible language for what they want to do, but a lot of people are using Python. And people are moving to Rust as well. So they're moving away from C, C++ to Rust because Rust manages the me memory better. So it it's more secure. It's less able to be attacked through cyber security. I think Stack Overflow does a survey once a year. Mm -hmm. It surveys um, software engineers every year. And it's always useful to look at that survey to see what the trends are, how things are changing, particularly for your area, if there's a particular area that you're writing software for. But in the area that I'm writing software for, Python has dominated. It would be difficult to use another programming language because it's what everybody uses. Indeed, yes. I know that Python is very popular really because of Jupyter Notebooks. It makes it so much easier to, uh, to run things and develop things, which is what it's got going for it. But as you say, the traditional languages like C and Fortran are not going to go away. Yeah, I think the what is funny about Python, though, is it was designed to be easy to use, modelling Fortran, really. So a lot of the arrays have similar structure to Fortran arrays. Um, but as time goes past, they keep on improving the language and it becomes more like a C++ or, or Fortran because managing your data structures, it's nice being interpreted because you can change what the data structures are on the fly or what the data type is on the fly. But that causes many problems. So as time goes by, it's just becoming very similar to Fortran and C and C++ and, and Rust as well. So there is certain functionality that you need in the these types of programming language. So that seems to yes. come out. And on the visualization front, you've got to be able to interface with what you need to draw pictures. And so that may influence your choice of language. I wrote my own visualization software in Fortran because I wrote it in the language I knew best. But if I was starting again today, I probably wouldn't write it in Fortran. If it's yeah, graphic. but then you also have to be able to talk to the graphics drivers, don't you? Yes. So OpenGL finally looks like it's on the way out because Apple won't support it. That's and interesting. that seems to be, yeah. So there's something which is called, we were looking at it recently, um, Web GPU. Seems oh, to be replacing okay. OpenGL currently. Anyway, uh, I've opened the floor. I know we're running a little bit late. I want to finish properly at nine o'clock, but we've got well, at least five minutes. Does anybody else want to uh, comment on anything? And also, Joe, do you want to quickly put your video on so that the, the audience can see you? I know you turn your video off for the main presentation. Oh, OK, because we were, of all the problems. You could have oh, all there, we go. Problems. there we go. There I am. Hi. There we go. I, I, I can see there's some bouncing dots by Federico. I'm wondering if he's wanting to say something. Uh, it just says on mine that Federico's connecting to audio, so maybe it's a kind of... Oh, a, I see. He's, he's not trying he's to right. type something. Okay. That's fine. But it doesn't seem like anyone's got any questions. We've all gone to sleep. Probably. If you've gone oh, to well. sleep, can you give me a, a wave using the reactions at the bottom? Then I know you've gone to sleep. They can't do that if they're asleep, though, can they? Yeah. That's difficult. Anyway, so, um, I did I take you on. back down memory lane there, Dan? It is, yes, but uh, I guess it's calls for everybody on the call. We could reminisce another time over a beer, probably. Yeah. Oh, look, Andrew sent something. Andrew. How can we make, oh, 
well, thank you, Jennifer. That's very nice of you. And how can we, I think we need more intermixing of scientists and industry. I think that's the best way to get the same sort of things going on. I have a theory that software engineering, there isn't really such a thing as research software engineering. I think these software engineering for things at the beginning of a of a innovation and things are when you've got a stable innovation. And I think if we talked about the software that I develop in terms of where we are on the innovation pipeline, we would have better be able to collaborate and talk more easily to industry. I think it's about being able to talk to industry and exchange ideas and then we're more likely to change use the same programming languages and tools in the same way there are differences that we don't under understand and we need to understand those so that we can talk more easily and um, that's something that i'm always sort of asking for i mean what is research software engineering have we defined what the research is how is that different to other forms of software engineering i think those well, sorts of questions need it's to be also answered. a question uh, where you're researching into software engineering or you're using software engineering for your research in the same way people differentiate between um computing for science and scientific computing if you like as yeah because a lot of people in as scientists and academia and otherwise, they are principally scientists. Like if you work at CERN or something like that, you're you're primarily a scientist and you need software tools and programming languages that help you do your job better. And that's quite different yeah. to somebody who is a computer science person who wants to dabble in a bit of chemistry or physics. Yeah, they coming up with the um the idea of practitioner calling people practitioners so people who do things are practitioners so software engineers or research software engineers are practitioners whereas scientists or computer scientists are theoreticians and they're not a practitioner and so there's a difference between being a having research or doing advanced practice does that make sense? Uh, yes, I think so, yes. And certainly you, you, yeah. the differentiation between um, computational science, which is now uh, properly recognised, it wasn't in the old days. Some people as career paths are computational scientists rather than um, scientific computing. Um, yeah, so the research software, I, I struggle with the research software engineering community they've tried to remove the term computational science so they try not to use it which is crazy to me because there's a a lot of history and a lot of sensible stuff that comes from that 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 understanding yeah so, so data scientists now as well but are there any data scientists that don't use use python because data scientists and python seem to be synonymous now I think you're right. Although also they use um, HPC, don't they? Data scientists, because really they're all fun. AI, moved to AI. Well, all the AI things. stuff, the, the, the PyTorch and stuff is all based on Python. So they, they're Absolutely. using Python to do there. But data science people seem to have, uh, as a group, seem to have descended on and taken on python as they the only way they they have for doing things yeah anyway uh one last chance for anybody else otherwise i'll uh i'll close the call so last chance right thank you very much once again uh joe for a very interesting talk <laughs>